Kia ora katoa and welcome to this community research webinar. It's my very great pleasure now to hand you over to our host for today's event, Kay Marie Dunn. Kei akwai te it's my great pleasure to hand that over to you. Kia ora tato, a tutahi he mihi kawa tu ki akoto katoa no na hawepa. A warm welcome to uh, all of you that have joined us for this very special event where we get to uh, have an intimate conversation uh, with Martin Paipo um, from Te Hau Ora o Awhio Whio o Otangare. So I'm really grateful to have you join us um, in this conversation uh, to talk us through your mahi what you do, your contributions within your local community, uh, and also provide uh, an insight to our many guests that have joined us today uh, into what it is that you do, how it is that you do it, um, and most importantly, how you're actually contributing to whānau ora uh, within your community, uh, locally, regionally, and nationally. Anō reira e mā, our friends, um, do make yourselves comfortable, and uh, I'd like to just um, mihi to you, Martin. Tēnā koe. how are you today? Tēnā koe, uh, Kei Marie. Um, koe ana, uh, tēnei e mihi atu ki a koutou e whānau mā, e whakarongo i ngā kōruro e tēnei ata. Ora e mihi atu ki a koutou. Kia ora. And so, as uh, Jan said, we're going to just get straight into it. And uh, we have a range of apartheid that we want to ask you to just help us initiate a conversation about the mahi that you do. And I guess before we do start, we'd just love to get a brief background from you, Martin, as to um, your organisation and your mahi within that organisation as well. We originally started off in 1990. We've been uh, 28 years in the social services sector. Uh, we grew as a small organisation, um, purely focused on youth services, mainly because a lot of our kids within our community, uh, same like other communities, weren't able to access um, activities and the normal facilities that were provided uh, to other communities, um, such as play areas and, and stuff like that, um, activities, camps and, and and other stuff like that. So we focused around that. Um, and our first uh, introduction to youth services was when um, we created our gymnasium. So I was into um, weightlifting at that stage, so it was a catalyst to start uh, the process with our young people. Kapai. And so your organisation talks about strengthening whānau aspirations. Can you give us an example of that and also describe to us what it looks like when it's really working. Farmer aspiration is about achieving hope. And when you when you've got hope, you've got to have something to to follow through with hope. Uh, the main things around hope is the economic advantage, um, the environmental advantage, um, everything else that um, relates to the home, the kind itself. So in terms of how it is working, we know when it is working when our whānau make the first steps through that door or when whānau are starting to participate in their daily activities of the community, uh, individually and collectively. So we do have a number of events just to uh, address some of the social activities um, that happen in the community with a theme that focuses on whānau wellness. Kilda. And that's quite important to you, um, considering where you're based, where your organisation is based, which is nestled right in the heart of Otangare. I mean, you could have gone anywhere. Why choose there? I grew up. I was educated. Um, I know the, the environment. I know the challenges that it portrays. And I know the influences that are within the community. I was part and parcel of it's changed in the early years through um, gangs and stuff like that. So I knew I breathed um, my community. Awesome. And it's wonderful to see that you're still there contributing. And so you've spent over 15 years working with Fano. Can you tell us about what's worked and what hasn't? Um, and if you knew now what you know in regards to what worked, what might you have done differently? Policy has always been the issue for a lot of NGOs. 
when you're talking about policy, it doesn't have a, a, a wide scope or a collective relationship across other ministries. What you've got is that for eons that we've been dealing with silos of service delivery um, being dictated to in, in most sense of we know we're the professional, we'll, we'll deal, you follow us and we'll direct you in the right pathway doesn't necessarily work, especially in communities such as ours, such as South Auckland, such as Cannons Creek. You've got to be flexible to work within those environments and understand the community at whole. What has worked for us, I, I suppose, is that we've had the flexibility to create and implement change, um, to understand um, changing environments. Also, that you've got to have the willingness to listen, not only listen, but to share, that it's not gate-kept. Um, we want all communities to have the same concept. We believe in the concept that it takes a village to raise a, a child. I believe in the teachings of our, our old that needs to be adapted and implement, implemented into the strategy today. Mm, kia ora. You know, I appreciate what you're saying there about the utilising our, our our elders or the the conversations and the knowledge that comes from our from our elders and in our community. And I guess knowing that you face a range of different challenges, what are the key challenges that you feel you're facing as as a provider uh, within your community? Uh, well, there, there's a number of, of things. Poverty is one, housing, um, economics. The majority of our community are on benefits, they say 70%. And then you're talking about single parent homes, you're talking about 54% um, of our community are state owned. So it's uh, all these things um, that are crushed into making our families feel like more being dependent on government. Uh, survival, let alone uh, utilising what strength that they have internally. And again, it comes back to the willingness to work as a collective. Kia ora. And so beforehand you talked about uh, government policy and how over the years you've been dictated to or, uh, you know, I guess jump through hoops, etc. How have you been able to maintain your mana motuhake or your ability to determine yourself in amongst a challenging policy environment that's tried to force you to do one thing, yet your outcome has been about your whānau in the community? Well, it's a, it's a continued discussion around kaupapa Māori, you know, what has worked for our environment. There's a baseline to, in terms of needs and aspirations of all whānau, but then you look at the system that's been set for Māori, it hasn't necessarily worked. So we've got to look back and what things that were successful in the Māori world. Um, the way we work with Fano, is still an understanding before we lose all those teachings and learnings that have been passed down from our elders. So can you just drill into that a little bit? Because one of the areas around social change in your community is the unique way that you do things which could be a very mildy way, but if you were to describe uh, an example of the kind of mahi that you do in community, particularly with whānau, and how you go about that, could you just give us a little bit of insight into that? Well, we've taken some learnings out of um, the whānau order concept around setting pathways. What does that look for our, like for our whānau, individually, collectively? How does wellness look in terms for them? The majority of the stuff that they scope out is one is that um, children are safe, children are educated, uh, children have good health. Um, not only that, that uh, the whole whānau are uh, being nurtured and they're being cared for, that they're actually being valued within the community. So they set the pathway. They actually are part of the resolution and solution to their wellness then it becomes our role to assist in their pathway of negotiating with those service providers to bring that service to Fano, not Fano going to um, search for which is the best one, to actually negotiate, have discussion, 
and have relationships with those who are passionate about actually delivering a service of wellness to whānau. Kia ora. And so could you give us an example of a whānau that may have come to you potentially in a state of crisis and then uh, an example of the intervention that your organisation did and a result of that? Well, I mean, whānau can come through the door with one specific need and that might be a financial need. But then in the discussion of the pathway, they've identified through discussion that they're elderly, uh, they're not getting their medication, that um, kids are not going to school. So then we're able to bring, in terms of within the organisation, kaiārahi that come and actually work and, and work with the whānau in terms of guiding them through that the maze of obstacles. Yeah, it's pretty difficult, I would assume, uh, with the layer, the myriad of needs that whānau have. How do, you, how do you contend with being able to only give as much as you can, but knowing sometimes it might not be enough? How do you, how do you resolve that within yourself? It's, it's never enough. I mean, it's continuing. You've got to continue to walk along that wall, um, come across those blockages and keep walking until you find that gap that you can actually um, walk through and open it up for our family. Kia ora. And so a, real, uh, a good example of what you're doing at the moment is your Ministry of Justice um, partnership uh, with corrections around your out-of-the-gate reintegration program. Can you please tell us a bit about that and how that works? Yeah, well, I, I suppose the success to that process was that we were preempting. Um, some of the issues that uh, our whānau are going to endure. One massive issue um, for our whānau is that accommodation. Because they've burnt the bridges of a lot of whānau um, and our whānau get hōhā with it, um, we've got to work in a dual process of creating relationships. How do we build those bridges um, and reassuring whānau that eventually it's going to be okay? There's going to be processes, there's going to be systems in place that will uffy not only the whānau returning, but the whānau that uh, back on the home front. So you've got to be able to do that. We do that um, by making the, the initial um, hui with the um, whānau where they've been incarcerated in prison. Um, we identify where their strengths are, where their aspirations are, um, we also actually, in terms of the preempting, um, we're checking off the checklist of prior to them being released. The normal fallover um, process, and it has been with ministries and other areas, um, corrections is one. Um, there's always been a process where they've come in, in, in a week prior to release and indicate to the whānau member, I need to see you at um, my office at 10 o'clock on the day you release um, or I'm breaching. Straight away, you built those, those blockages with our whānau. So in terms of um, meeting that need, on pickup, we've agreed as the first of our checklist, take our whānau member directly to probation so he can do that checklist. We're yep. preempting in terms of the steps of freedom. Um, prior to that, meeting with work and income. Um, the issue around with them was that um, in terms of being on the benefit, the priority for the ministry was employment. Now, some of these uh, whānau um, have uh, parole conditions, and it could be the, through family violence that they have to attend uh, anger management that becomes, that supersedes everything else. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been able to negotiate. It's not so much getting them employed, but getting them ready to work so that they are able to attend and get another uh, of those processes where all the requirements um, checked off. The accommodation, uh, we had to every um, crack and cranny uh, have that discussion uh, reassure from backpackers to um, 
YDubs to motor camps to whānau members to extended whānau members, reassuring that there's going to be a continuum of um, discussions and conversations that also that we would be there at every call of the whānau members. So reassuring whānau that we are going to be with them. We're not just leaving them there to um, handle um, any challenges that they may uh, be preempting uh, or, or assuming that um, the family member may do, um, that we are there. And also having that discussion in um, turn within corrections um, with the family member, this is what we're going to do. This is the relationship. So having a firm understanding of what their relationship may be with the whānau and the whānau member. So everything's sort of preempted, everything's planned. Um, so there's a checklist, there's a priority, um, and everything's done with the uh, with the um, kaiārahi and the whānau member. So and then um, the other part to it is to meet their whānau within the organisation, um, welcome them back and reassure them that, um, you know, we are going to support them and their whānau members. So we hui um, internally, externally and with the whānau member. So that's been really good. Um, out of 243, I think we had three return. So that was pretty cool for us. Wow, that's awesome. And, and so that kind of enables us to reflect on the, on the next part, which is how do you feel the whānau order approach has revolutionised the way that you do things? Well, it was, it was a starting format for like-minded organisations to discuss and have a collective vision of what wellness and how we can work together. It wasn't so much hearsay, it was about do say. Um, enough of hui hui and let's get on with the doi. Um, we've, as an organisation, we've evolved it um, and we've gone back. I spent a bit of time with uh, Professor Manuka Hinaru and we've now developed a kind of order strategy. We've been two years into it. Um, we, how whānau order was working about a collective res responsibility and response to with whānau, we took that back to the kainga into the home economic and um, uh, um, whānau wellness started off within the home. So we focused on that. Um, we're looking at now and we moved into the social housing um, to see that as a, as a final solution in terms of our whānau. Um, so it, is, it was a catalyst for us, not as organisations, to sit on the, the strategy, but to advance it. And so, you know, throughout your quarter, or you've continuously referred to Farno and really working with the Farno, and even being pre uh, preemptive and proactive and ensuring that Farno don't fall in the fall in a crack and get lost there. You've actually literally kind of created a bridge for these Farno to be able to navigate their way, particularly in the out of the gate program because it meant that obviously they're not going to go back to prison because they've been unable to fulfil the requirements that corrections have uh, applied to them. So it sounds as if you're applying the whānau order process, which is looking at the whole whānau wellness um, and actually applying it there, and it also sounds as if it's working. Where else is it working in your organisation? Well, we have a, a number. We hold all the ministerial contracts. So it's important that it goes right across the organisation and across every sector. So we have um, service providers who have gone as teams of whānau members so that, that when whānau comes through the door, we're not going to individually or calling others into the format so they're already part of that solution internally. Okay. And so has that also uh, influenced the way that you manage your organisation? So whānau order is a policy, whānau order is a practice, but also how do you apply whānau order internally within your organisation you manage? 
Well, yeah, uh, you know, I have that view that is, in terms of service provision, we don't see it as a service provision. We see it as an approach. It's an approach that's been given to our, our whānau through um, our, our tūpuna. So I, I don't see it as a, a service provision. It's a way of life for us. So it's re- reminding our whānau, this is how it is. You know, you belong. You belong to that Fano. So, our and, and I'm sort of pretty hard line in terms of our our, our services. Um, and I believe that um, if we can't give our Fano the best of the best, then we need to reconsider where we're sitting. Okay. And so, what we'd love to know from you, uh, Martin, is ha- thinking about your experience, what you've done with Fano. How do you? How might you share that learning? Um, within your own community, but also um, the sector as a whole? I suppose if there was any learning, the whole process and in terms from a, a, a cope up side is that everything is unconditional. We can't switch off or we can't choose um, when or who. Um, and you get those times when it can get really challenging, um, but it's unconditional. And Tiko is, is unconditional. Um, we're challenged. Everyone is a challenge who works in that sector on a daily basis. Being able to be flexible um, and have that willingness to adapt and implement change by through flexibility. And the organisation has to reflect that. We can say, again, that policy restricts us from actually implementing something that will work for our farmer. Um, and that's what we've um, reassured um, as an organisation to staff, that if you have a solution, um, I'm not going to take it to the board. If it works, it works, um, and we'll work through it. Um, so there's got to be a willingness um, to participate and be flexible in terms of some of the challenges that we get. Kia ora. And so um, as we start to wrap up, because, you know, we, this is a very short, sharp get into the conversation and we've got some resources that we'd like to share uh, with our listeners as well today. I'd like to ask you, top three tips, top three tips you feel are integral in supporting Farno towards actualising their potential? I think uh, flexibility, uh, that your service is unconditional, um, that... I, I suppose listening to farming so that you can learn from them. Kilda, beautiful. Sounds like aroha in action, actually. So where you're talking about being unconditional and actually applying the, the concept of aroha, where you're turning to the sacred breath of that person and that Fano and acknowledging who they are, where they come from, uh, and grounding that within a kaupapa Māori framework which is an essence that we come from we have our ancestors and we have our ways of doing things and it may not necessarily just be applicable to whānau Māori it could also be applicable to families oh. uh, locally and nationally tēnā koe e hua uh, mō, mō o whakaro rangatira uh, i te atane. Um, I'd like to now hand it over to my colleague Jan um, who may have a pātai but also she has some fantastic resources to share with us as well tēnā koe, tēnā koutou. Kia ora kei Marie. Martin, nga mahi, kia koe mō tō whakaro. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. I'm going to just uh, sh- share with our listeners or viewers some resources which we think will help them with their mahi. And uh, we'll pick up on some of the points that you've made there as well. So I'm going to share my screen now and take us to a website. I'm going to ask for somebody just to let me know if that's showing up. Yep. We're going to go to the final oral research website. So some of you may remember that this is a project which was initiated by the Tangata Whanua Caucus of Community Research. So when you go away from today's experience, one of the places that you may like to look is whanauoraresearch.co.nz. And we're going to send you this link when we distribute resources at the end of today's webinar. This website was... Um, convened and initiated by a steering group of final oral research pr- practitioners, including Katarina Pipi and Nan Wehipehana and Fiona Kram. 
So on here are items of research and resources to assist you in your mahi if you're working with whanau. Martin talked a little bit earlier about the value of sharing our learning. And, I, and Martin and I had a corridor this morning, and you were saying to me, Martin, that um, actually you, kind of, you can't be selfish. And in the competitive nature of things, learning and research is about sharing. And that runs counter to some of the sort of we see around us. So here at Community Research, we're all about sharing our learning. It's great to have you here today, Martin, and to be able to hear about the learning that you're able to offer to this uh, webinar. And I'm going to, I'm just showing you now the Community Research Code of Practice. Designed in consultation, this is written by Robin Kamira, and written in consultation with um, over 20 NGO, Tangata Whenua community and voluntary sector experts. And in it, it sets and guidelines for researchers who are wishing to work with communities to get that relationship right from the outset. And so you will see that it, within the context are some of the tikanga Māori principles to undertaking research as the baseline principles to working well with communities when we do our, when we undertake our research. Um, so, Kira Martin, I wanted to ask you if you would tell us a little bit more about how you find time within all of this busy. I mean, clearly you're a very large agency and service provider and you're working with a, a wide number of Fano and communities there. How do you find the time for the reflection and the learning within amongst your people that allows you to be able to, you know, capture what's working well so that you're able to apply it more richly in your work? How do you manage that? Probably because most of the time I'm in and out of the community. But in and around, when I talk about in and out, I'm around in terms of meeting our whānau and, and doing different things with our whānau members. Whether it's, it's enough time, I, I don't know. But uh, in terms of R&R, &R, for me, it's my mokos who are in our community as well. So I have a responsibility to them um, also in terms of leading that legacy, but um, no one has enough time. And if that's the passion, then um, that's what you've got to do. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. I'm going to hand back to Kay Marie. Um, thanks for that quick chat with you. Well, kia ora tato. Thank you, Martin. And um, we're so lucky that we've got some fantastic resources uh, for those of you that are community practitioners uh, or those of you that wish to explore research opportunities with Fano. That Fano order uh, resource will be fantastic um, for you to refer to. And also, there's an opportunity for you to share your learnings on that website as well, which I think is really fantastic as a living resource uh, that is useful and purposeful. And just briefly reflecting on your corridor today, Martin, one of the key themes that I got out of here today was about whānau, that your work over the last 15, 20, 30 years has been all about strengthening and empowering whānau. And in order to do that well and effectively, you're more than just a service provider. You're an active member of your community. So you are in and part of your community, which sounds like a strength of being able to help with the transformations on an individual basis. I heard that you are open, uh, that you are willing to listen and learn from the whānau. So you're not there imposing your view, but you are there trying to support whānau along the way. Uh, and also your significant role in negotiating with a series of agencies that have their own kaupapa and trying to be a kōrawai for whānau um, so that you're not stuck in the silo, but you're working really hard on bringing all those different elements together. Uh, nō reira e hua. Uh, I'm also mindful that we never do things on our own. So I have to mihi to all your kaimahi that support you, your family that obviously give you the, the kaha, the strength to be able to do what you do, your mukapuna where you are refreshed and revitalised because that's the legacy that you're leaving, uh, and also the many whānau that are, are touched by the work that you do. Uh, and whānau ora is about, hey, this is not just o tāngarei, this is whāngarei, Te Inga Parawa, there's um, Ngāti Hine, Ngāpuhi, um, Te Rarua, there's all of the different elements, and that's just in the top of the north. Then you've got all the other rōpū out there doing amazing work. So you're a fantastic bastion and light of hope and amongst some very dark times for whānau. Um, nō reire hoa, 
Tenakwe, Jan and our team here from uh, Community Research. Uh, you've been doing some hard work behind the scenes getting this together. So ngā mihi koa tu ki koto. And for all of you that have come today, it's been fantastic uh, that you've taken uh, this uh, bite-sized time to be here with us. And I do hope that you look into the work that... Um, that has been done in Otangare. Continue to tune in for 2017 for our follow-up webinars. Um, and also, if you have any ideas for people that you'd like to see, please let us know. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou.